After my son was shot, my whole family became targets for the British Army. Uh, they, they would ask them their name and address, and whenever they would say who they were, um, they were beat up. Ireland is one of the very few places that democratically and peacefully voted itself out of the empire. And it did so by uh, a majority of in excess of 85% of the electorate. Partition occurred when the Irish nationalist movement, frustrated at the inability to get independence by peaceful means, fought a war of independence. An artificial entity has been created which has imprisoned both Catholics and Protestants in a very painful and, and very bitter uh, web of history. The British government created the six county state by carving out from Ireland the largest land area in which it would be possible to maintain in perpetuity a majority of Protestant loyalists. That then created um, an impetus of which forced those people to set up structures which would ensure their domination in perpetuity. Military structures, legal structures, economic structures of discrimination. I've been, I was born, I've been born in, in, in the six counties and I've lived uh, with intimidation all my life and discrimination because job ways, house way, house ways and educational ways, uh, ways, I was always discriminated against. I was classified and was always aware that I was a second class citizen in my own country. I think it's really inherent in the nature of the state. It was set up on a sectarian head count. It was set up in a situation where the majority of people in, in Ireland didn't want the state. A very big minority within the state didn't want it. And the only way it could maintain itself was by institutionalizing sectarianism and maintaining sectarian discrimination and repression. And I think that so long as it continues, it will have to continue to do that. So if you build a state that tries to exclude one third of its community from democratic power, from education and from employment, you're building a problem. The legacy of the 50 years of discrimination and repression provoked the Catholic minority into revolt in the 60s. They revolted peacefully, but that peaceful protest was met with repression and they didn't get reforms. In the late 1960s, there was a civil rights movement here which was completely unarmed, non-military. Uh, the British government could not deal with that. And they, by a series of manoeuvres, uh, including the shooting down of 13 uh, protesters in, in Derry uh, in, in the early 70s, by a series of manoeuvres, they turned that uh, peaceful protest uh, campaign into a military campaign because they thought they could deal with it. The state has basically existed in a state of emergency from its inception. It began with the British Defence of the Realm Act. Uh, in every generation in Northern Ireland, internment without trial has been in operation. We have had now for 20 years non-jury courts. We've had a whole series of uh, interferences with the legal process, the use of supergrasses, uh, torture of prisoners to obtain confessions and so on. Britain has been dragged again and again before the European Court of Human Rights for its violations of human rights in Northern Ireland. And the only way they can contain the situation here is by this type of repressive legislation and by a massive army of occupation. And it's, it's a bit like the Vietnam War for America, that it eventually becomes a war that can't be won and can only be held to a draw by fighting a dirty war of repressive measures, armed of occupation, undercover assassinations, and so on. All of which has its effect on the, on the British state itself because it is gradually destroying the traditions of democracy within Britain itself. It was a sunny August afternoon, and uh, we was standing around with a few of his friends. Uh, we had a couple of drinks, 
I suppose. Uh, and a scuffle broke out with a uh, foot patrol. Uh, his mates started, the, the soldiers started to arrest him. Uh, my brother, he started to run to avoid arrest. Um, <clears throat> a soldier ran out. He ran after him soon, and he couldn't catch him. Uh, and I think one of the, whoever was in charge shouted to the soldier, shoot the bastard. And uh, he couldn't catch him at all, so he knelt down and shot him in the back. He was, he was murdered for uh, just nothing, like, you know. Shot down like a dog. You can't have your army over here, armed to the teeth, bored to the teeth, filled with irrational prejudices about the people in this country, and expect them to say, excuse me, sir, do you mind if I look inside the boot of your car while good evening, madam? Isn't it a lovely day? Because uh, their soldiers do get shot. And because they don't know. They, you know, they don't know if the person who will say good evening, officer, will shoot them tomorrow. That, that's war. That is, that is the sad reality of war. <laughs> My sister was shot in 1981. She was 12 years of age when she was shot. And one of the soldiers shouted out, we're going to get one of these bastards for our five today. A plastic bullet was then discharged and Carl Ann was hit. She lived on the life support machine for three days and then died. In training, they took us through um, a gallery, what they called the Home Goals Gallery, a big blow of photographs. IRA atrocities. Needless to say, there was no photographs of victims there a bloody Sunday, plastic bullet victims, anything like that, you know. Brian was in home at a quarter past six. He went out. I had given two pence and he had went out. And at 28 minutes past six, a boy came to the door and told me that Brian was shot with a plastic bullet. And he was only 13. And I know he was no threat to anybody. This began purely and simply because the Catholic nationalist community finally came to the end of their tether and they asked for equality in this society. Equality in jobs, housing and voting and an end to special powers and military policing. Now, if the English people really knew what was taking place here, if they were allowed to debate it, I believe all of their instincts would lead them to say, this is intolerable, this must be ended. The very last thing I ever saw was one, one young man having his head beat off a uh, sarsen. So I felt very, very frustrated, felt so helpless. Didn't know how to scream or cry or what to do, at what, at what was going on in the street. And I told one of my children, my teenage children, to put on a record. And she put on a record for green fields. And it was only plain minutes when a paratrooper stepped right in front of my window and fired directly into my face. I was taken to the hospital and my eyes were so badly damaged that they both had to be removed. I just wanted to die. When you're the mother of 11 children and you've led a very active life, to be told you'll never see your children again, I just couldn't accept it. And for no reason at all. The Northern Ireland state has failed. It has palpably and de demonstrably failed. And the attempt to continue it in existence, to keep it going, just leads to a steady hemorrhage of blood to the political and military conflict that we have which kills 100 people a year, maims 1,000 people a year, results in hundreds of people being jailed, has devastated the economy of the area and led to massive unemployment. How do you resolve that? And it seems to me that the only way that you can resolve that now is by looking again at the whole political structure of the place. And you have one dynamic drive to reintegrate it with the rest of Ireland. You have a resistance to that, but is that resistance based on anything tangible? Is it possible to continue a separate state in Northern Ireland? And, and, and 
and for it to be a democratic entity, and I don't believe it is. The myth of Catholics and Protestants not being able to live together was invented uh, in order to keep control of the people. Our loyalist minority in Ireland is a besieged and frightened minority, and it is our obligation as Irish people to demonstrate quite conclusively to those people that they shall have an equal and just place in a new Irish society. There will be no domination for any group or any section, whether it be uh, clerical, uh, whether it be political, or whether it be economic. It must be a society of equality. I think what people have clearly to understand is that those of us who most want to see an end to the British Army and an end to partition are not asking the Protestant people of the North to live in Charlie Hawhey's free state. I wouldn't live in it myself, and I wouldn't ask anybody else <laughs> to live in it. Uh, and I think if they, if they knew that, you, you should be fit to build a country here ourselves. The conflict just goes on. It is endless unless somebody breaks the circle. The people who have the power to break the vicious circle are the British government. And they can do that in two steps. They can do it by saying that they are going to withdraw from Northern Ireland, they're going to withdraw the troops from Northern Ireland, that the future of Northern Ireland lies with the South, and then agree with the Southern government to a roundtable conference of everybody involved in the conflict, including the IRA, including the Protestant paramilitary groups, because there can't be any solution without involving the main actors. What I would like to see them, see them announce is, first of all, a clear declaration that they now appreciate that peace in Ireland depends on self-determination for the Irish people as a whole. And in order to allow that to develop, the British will begin the process of withdrawing from Ireland. And that the first step, very much like the Russians in Afghanistan, the first step is the program and the date by which every soldier will be out of the country. I never think that my grandchildren would live in a more peaceful country than I have lived in all my life. And I think that the only way they will live in that kind of peace is to get Britain out of Ireland because I think it's time the British people realise that we have suffered all down the years at the hands of, Brit of the British government and I think it's time that they pulled out and left us to rule ourselves and for, my, for the benefit of my grandchildren it can't come soon enough because I feel I owe it to them to let them live in a more peaceful just society and I've ever lived in.